Hi, I'm Stephen Drucker. I'm a partner and research manager of the Microsoft uh, VITA group, which stands for Visualization and Interactive Data Analytics. I've been here at Microsoft Research for almost 25 years, uh, so it's uh, really exciting to be able to show you some of the things that I've been working on. So uh, this talk is about data visualization, and uh, really it kind of comes from the fact that these days we're inundated with data. We're drowning with data. There's, there's over 5 billion videos that are watched a day on YouTube. There are 350 million photos per day. And this was in 2017, so it keeps on going up. So what, you know, well, what do you do with this? Well, it really presents an opportunity. And you're seeing data science emerging as a, a field of research and uh, jobs are doing it. In fact, job trends in data scientists is one of the fastest growing areas of jobs, and it keeps on going up. Uh, you look at quotes from prominent researchers and, and media and saying that we're entering this new world where data is as important as software. Um, you're, you're seeing that folks are saying uh, that the sexy job in the next 10 years will be uh, for statisticians. And, uh, you know, the, the, this is uh, from Hal Varian, the chief economist at Google, and it says, you know, people thought he was joking, but, you know, who thought that computer engineers were going to be the sexy job? So this is clearly an uh, opportunity. Lots of attention is being paid towards machine learning and, da uh, and data science. But really, where do you start? Um, there, there's so many different ways to approach this and di different backgrounds. And I'm approaching this from my background as a human interaction researcher. And there's a very, very simple, you know, from 1988, there was this idea that if humans are interacting with computers, they need to figure out what's going on in the computer and they need to figure out how they can impact that interaction. This is called the gulf of evaluation and execution. So th this is fundamental to all sorts of human computer interaction, but uh, what, how do you actually do that when you're interacting with data? So the key, in my view, is by using visualization to help bridge that gap. So having a representation of that data lets people understand and control the, the things that they're trying to control. So. That's what data visualization is. It's been around for a long time. There's all sorts of historical references going back uh, over 200 years. Uh, there's famous uh, representations of this in the data. You can go look up some of these references in here. Uh, but arguably, and there's been some recently uh, published material, Elijah Meeks said that arguably 2019 is the year visualization became mainstream. And you're seeing this partly because we're becoming more visual as a people, where we're, we're at, Politic, politics is doing it. I'll do some political examples later. And uh, uh, visualization is completely in the public domain. So really being able to understand this a little bit better and understand some of the nuances that go into this is what this talk is about. So first of all, what is data visualization? And uh, here, there's a definition you can see there. It's the art and science of representing abstract information. Uh, and that's really important. Uh, in an interactive visual form that enables people to more easily gain insights through the perceptual and cognitive capabilities. Now, that's a mouthful, but we can kind of take this apart and look at some of the basics of data visualization to kind of understand what, what's really going on with that. So here's some, some basics. Um, a lot of people say, okay, look, you know, I, I, I've seen tables of numbers. I've got stats. I, uh, you know, wh why do I need a picture of this? Well, if you've got stats, you might know things like, um, here are these table of numbers. It happens to be that all of these groups have the same exact mean, the same exact variance of the X, and the same exact variance of the Y, uh, same correlation. You know, what, what else do I need to know? Well, when you put up a simple picture, you can see each of these pictures is very different. One shows a trend that's moving upwards with a little bit of variation. The other shows something that's trend is was going upwards and going downwards. One showing a very, very exact trend with one single outlier. And the other is showing something that's really all around one number and with one outlier. So again, seeing that picture really makes a difference. And in fact, it's not just these things. You could actually have all sorts of things with that same mean, same uh, mean of X, mean of Y, same correlation, and get a very different picture. So for instance, there's the data source, which is the same mean in X, the same mean in Y, and yet it clearly is very different. So it's really important to kind of be able to look at these things before you start saying, ah, oh, I understand the stats. Having that picture makes a difference. Now, there have been lots of books. I, I, I picked pre, three prominent books here that you can look up uh, about this, about how you do good visualization, what's visualization research. But again, 
you don't need to necessarily delve down completely. You just need to kind of understand some of the basics about this. So here, here's one term called pre-attentive processing, which is a fundamental part of visualization. And you can see as an example, here's a bunch of threes. And I'm going to ask you, how many threes do you count in these bunch of numbers? You know, you might say, oh, three, four, uh, uh. well, if I highlight them like this, it pops out. That's because we notice those numbers. Now, now it's good that I highlight these things correctly, because if I actually didn't, if I missed a three and show that, you would say, oh, there were, there, there were three threes that uh, I saw, when there was actually four. So it's really important that we're honest and we do it well and accurately, because you can mislead, and that's, a, that's another trend that goes on in this. But that pre-attentive processing really it helps us see things quicker. So here's an example, just very simply, which is that you look at these and you pop out, what's the difference between those two things? You don't have to look at all those individual circles one at a time. One pops out because of the color. We, we pre-attentively focus on color. Color's not the only thing. We also pre-attentively focus on other things. What's the difference between these? You should see that it's the red circle on the right. And uh, you know that that we we notice that you didn't have to scan through that whole thing. However, these things are complicated. When you combine those two situations, it gets much harder. You actually now have to scan and and look at all these things. And experiments have done, and they've measured how the reaction time is, and they see that this takes a linear amount of time to see that there was a red circle on the left side and not on the right side. Okay. There are lots of pre-attentive cues, and this is something studied in psychophysics, and you can look at all these things. And we use these as sources of, of um, design ideas to do visualizations, and you'll see that later on. Now, uh, pre-attentive cues aren't the only part of uh, visualization. Another really important part is how well we measure comparisons. So how, many, how much bigger is that right circle to the left circle? Any guesses? Is it five times, six times, seven times, eight times, nine times? You know, it's really hard to tell. So we can, we can guess, second guesses, you usually do a survey. Um, now, how about this? How much longer is the wide bar from the smaller bar? Turns out those were exactly the same. And it was seven times. If we kind of look at this this way, you can see that there were seven circles that kind of make up that small circle. Um, and then for this, again, seven of these to make up that small ones. But people do much better at understanding that length rather than the area. And in fact, there have been studies where we've ranked how well people perceive these things. And this is a lot of what research goes on in this, is what we can see that we're much more accurate at, at judging positions uh, or lengths than slopes. And volumes are really tough for us to judge. But these are kinds of some of these experiments that help us understand how to encode information in ways that people can gain insights from that. So does that mean that we kind of now know that there's a single best representation? You get some data and now, oh, uh, well, let, let me show it. Well, obviously not. It really depends on what you're trying to communicate. So as I mentioned before, you know, politics is, is replete with people trying to communicate information. So. There was a, a bunch of years back when Obama was running for re-election that there was actually an argument with data that was going on in the media. It was kind of fascinating to watch people take the same exact data and present it in very different ways. There was first this graph that, that came out to say that the moment that Obama came to office, things turned around. You can see this directly, red down there, oh, bad, you know, all of a sudden things start to improve. Well, it's, it's really kind of interesting because it was the choice of what they were showing here. This was actually job losses and job creations. So it wasn't the absolute number of jobs. It was that things turned around, but there were still jobs being, uh, you know, there were still lots fewer jobs than before. So there was a response to that where they show this in a different way. They showed, oh, wow, look, jobs haven't recovered at all. And, and previously they recovered in the same period of time. Another way of looking at the same data that shows a very different point of view. Well, there was a response to that saying, well, yeah, fine, but things were going up coming into this administration, and then they turned around going the, the wrong, the different direction. And all of a sudden, things have turned this, and this is only a half year, so it's okay. So you go back and forth. Well, fine, oh, this is all complicated. Let's just show the overall unemployment rate during the years. years. Another way of breaking out that same data, and you see a very different answer. So it's like, well, let's delve down this into a little bit more detail. Let's look at all the last few presidents so we can see how these kind of go. And every time there's been a Democrat, a blue one, things have gone down. And every time there's been a, a, a Republican one, employment has gone up. 
So another way of looking at that. Well, yeah, but fine. Let, let's look, look how bad things were under this last um, administration. You know, look how much worse things got there. Bigger context. Well, let's actually put it in even a bigger context. This is what that same curve was looking like before. And this was what the, recession, the, the Great Depression looked like. So again, these are different ways of looking at same data, slicing it differently, representing it differently to put out different arguments. And that's really important because the representation that you're choosing can help make your point very differently. So yeah, there's some other political content. We can actually look at you know the 100 days unemployment rates under different presidents. And you can see, again, this is similar to one of the other ones, but this is often featured. But is the 100, first 100 days really the right thing to be looking at? for a president. Really, you want to be looking at the entire term. You want to look at some of the other things. Even the choice of color can make a very big, big difference. So this is the 2016 election, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, and you can say, OK, you know, look how red everything is. Well, it turns out that we are sensitive to colors in different ways. And if you actually show um, them with equal saturation, you end up seeing uh, you know, a very different picture just with the same numbers. And even that is somewhat misleading because what it's showing here really is the square footage of people that have voted for the president. So this was a, a, um, a picture that was put out by the, um, uh, the Trump administration saying, oh, you know, look, look how overwhelmingly um, Trump was elected by. But then there was a response to that, taking that same data and saying, actually, you know, that's square footage. We, we don't really care about square footage. Let's actually size each of those areas by how many people were voting in those areas and transforming that. And you can see that same essential data, but a very different view. Now you're seeing, you know, where were their people? Where were they concentrated? And um, how did people vote? Again, sometimes people ask, what is right? They're both right. They're both representing different things. And you have to think about what you should be paying attention to. And that's part of what this whole talk is about, is that you need to be able to know what you're seeing and know what the, the, the potential deception is in order for you to skeptically inquire to do that. Okay? So the, yeah, I'm not the only person talking about that. There's even a book about this, and, and there's, there's lying with statistics, and there's even uh, recently a book by Alberto Cairo about uh, lying with charts and visualizations. And in fact, sometimes there's intentional deception. Like, for instance, there's, there's this graph that came out a little while ago that shows the number of abortions and how they've gone up versus the number of cancer screenings at Planned Parenthood. Well, one of the problems about this graph is that it was actually intentionally deceptive because you're putting um, two very different numbers on the same axis. When you actually put this on the common axis, this is actually what it looks like. So that was intentionally put out to deceive. Um, sometimes there's also, there's, there was a recent debate about climate change, about how if we look at this in terms of the uh, amount of degrees that have grown, uh, that have changed since the 1880s, oh, it's, it's hardly anything. You can see that that line is almost flat. Well, there's a question about whether we should be using zero, since especially in temperature, uh, zero is kind of arbitrary. There's absolute zero, there's zero in Fahrenheit, zero in Celsius, there's all sorts of other things. If you actually really want to look at that trend, you can just kind of look in on that trend. You can look at how much it's gone up from the 1920s till now. So again, a different slice of the data emphasizing different things can make a di big difference. And again, sometimes that's intentional, sometimes it might not be intentional. So it's not even just the representation that we're using, it's how we analyze the data. So uh, 538 is a, a, a great um, blog that often features data visualizations as part of this. And they, they showed actually that if you analyze the, this data and say, does the economy do better under the Republicans or the Democrats, depending upon what you mean by those statements, you can get completely different answers. You can get uh, if you choose, it, does that mean governors? Does that mean the president? Does that mean Congress, uh, the, the House of Representatives, Senate? Does it mean unemployment? Does it mean inflation? Does it mean GDP? If you choose different combinations of these things, you can get different results in each of those examples. So um, this is one way where it's positive. It's a publishable result. This is a way it's almost publishable the other direction. So, so you can actually sit there and there's a site, you can try it out for yourself to see those things. And one of the things they did on the site was that they found that if they gave the same data to 
Uh, 29 different research things. In this case, it was about so bias in soccer teams and whether there were more red cards given to uh, dark skin players or not. They analyzed the data by 29 different research teams, and they found this variety of different responses. And most of them are kind of a couple outliers, uh, but you're seeing that it really helps to actually analyze this from many different points of view. So there's this whole potential that if you do this analysis, you might end up deceiving yourself. So th this is a great example from, from uh, um, uh, XKCD comic where um, someone comes and says, you know, I think that there's a link between jelly beans and acne. But when they do that analysis, you know, it turns out that the, the anal analysis didn't come out that there was any link. But then they say, well, maybe it's only a certain color. Let's try purple jelly beans. Let's try red jelly beans. And they keep on trying different kinds of jelly beans until, you know, lo and behold, one of these green jelly beans right here, um, wow, there, there's a significant result there. When we sliced it this way, we got different results. So what do they do? Oh, this is sensational. Let, let's publish this. Let, let, let's do this. Now, it might have been that they were trying to deceive others with this, but maybe they were actually just doing the wrong, wrong kind of statistical analysis. When you slice this too many times, you know, there's a 1 in 20 chance that you're going to get a significant result from P is less than 0.05. And that's what, what happens. So that you can deceive yourself if you're not aware and doing the right things. Um, another way of, of doing self-deception is thinking that causation and correlation are the same. This is, this is a great example from uh, Google Correlate, where we look at the per capita consumption of margarine and find out that um, it correlates 99.2% with the divorce rate in Maine. Well, if you do enough of these trends and analyses and other things, you're going to find some really weird aberrant correlations. It doesn't say that these things aren't correlated, but it does not say that they're causally related. And again, a lot of people will mind data this, see a pattern, a, cause, a, a, a correlation, and they'll think, ah, these things must be related. So now, I've used a lot of examples where visualization um, is kind of confusing, but I really propose that visualization and multiple views can help you understand data. So I'm going to show some of these examples, uh, particularly on, on cases that uh, people don't understand very well. You know, they're, they're, we don't understand percentages. We don't understand, uh, you know, Bayesian reasoning and all, all sorts of things like that. So we're going to look at an example from uh, the uh, gender bias investigations in, in Berkeley uh, in 1973. And um, you know, one of the things is that visualization can really help illuminate uh, the, the um, uh, what's going on here. So let's let's first look at the entire population here. So here are all the uh, 4, 464 students that applied for graduate school, and we can look at the overpopulation, and we can see how many were accepted in uh, blue and how many were rejected in red. And okay, you know, it's about 40% were accepted. And then we can break that down by gender. And as I said before, um, it looks like there's some bias, uh, way more percentage-wise of the uh, men were accepted than the women. So essentially, almost 50% of the men were accepted, while uh, only 27% uh, of the women were accepted. But something strange is happening. When we break this out by department, now we're starting to see something strange. In every single department, the women were better than the men or almost at parity. So, yeah, right, a little closer. So, wait, if there seems to be bias against women, why are they doing so well when we compare it to the departments? Well, the key here to realize is that um, Department A and Department B are accepting lots of people. Department E and F are accepting hardly any people. And when we look to see where the men and where the women were applying, all the men were applying to Department A and Department B, almost no women there. And there were more women applying to Department E and F. So what you're seeing that, yes, where you see these absolute numbers, um, they did better percentage-wise than the men, but there weren't that many absolute numbers. So being able to break this apart by these statistics really helps them understand this, and then you can see where this bias comes from. So. At first, when I showed you that, it didn't make sense, but actually breaking it down, seeing step-by-step -step representations really helps you understand that. Uh, there's another example, and this again happened in real life, when we were looking at um, women that were getting breast cancer screenings. 
And um, the facts are kind of laid out here that 1% of the women over the age of 40, uh, when they have a routine screening, have breast cancer. And that um, 80% of the women that have breast cancer will get positive mammograms. Uh, but 9.6% uh, of the women uh, without breast cancer will also get positive mammograms. That's called a false positive rate. So um, if a woman is tested positive uh, in the mammogram, what's the likelihood of she actually having cancer? Doctors were asked this. And, you know, you, you can kind of think to yourself, is it 030, 3060, 6000? Um, this is really just Bayes' rule. Um, this is something from probability you can look at. And 95% of the doctors said it was between 70 and 80%, when the actual number is 7.76%. What was happening actually is with that there were there were double mastectomies or mastectomies that were occurring when they did not need to. Partly because it's like, oh, you've got a positive screening when you gotta do that. Well, looking at all that math is very difficult to do. Let's actually kind of look at the same thing uh, visually. So let's actually go and look at this again in a step-by-step -step explanation. Yeah, here's 2,000 women that um, have a cancer screening test, a mammogram test. And we look and say, you know, this is how many women actually would have cancer in, the, in this population. Okay, you know, just scattered about here, about 1%. All these numbers are from most statistics. And so you can see that really it's a very small number uh, of those people. So how many people then would have a positive mammogram? You can see that, that of those uh, w women that have cancer, yeah, 80%, you know, we, we do a lot. There's also that false negative, um, about 9%. 9%. Again, when we, when we look at these by percentage, you can see that 80% of the women that, don't have can that do have cancer have it, and about 9.6% of them do. But you saw how many there were. So when we actually look at the absolute numbers of these things, um, this is how many positive results they have. This is how many negative results uh, that they have of the mammogram. We don't get too many wrong um, that uh, essentially um, don't have cancer, uh, that, that have cancer, but they had a positive screening, so they missed it. So we're, we're pretty good. We only get missed four of them. Um, and, um, but there's still all those false negatives. So again, that's why you're seeing it's really only the 7.5% that, that had it, you know, 8% or so. So again, when you look at this visually, I mean, it takes a couple times to go through it, and you can actually try this online yourselves, but you can see, ah, now I'm really understanding what's going on here. And again, if you kind of look at this randomly, you can also see how many false negatives there are. And you can even represent this as, as this common confusion matrix where you have false positives uh, on the uh, top left, false negatives on the uh, bottom right, and, um, and the true negatives on the left and the true positives on the right. So again, having these looked at this way, it's like, now I understand. And, you know, if you actually broke it down like this, you might not be doing false mastectomies to, to, to result of this. Here's a, another example where we're, we try to look at bias in decision making. And now this is not an example that I, I did. This is an example that some colleagues, Martin Wattenberg and Fernando Vegas did. Um, where they were looking at two different populations that might be uh, given a loan from a bank. And what happens is that um, when it's very easy to say, oh, here's a FICA score, here, here's a credit score, and if it's very clear that everybody above a certain amount is going to repay a loan, we just give those people a loan, and everybody below a certain amount is going to not repay, we deny those people a loan. Problem is that those populations often overlap. So they built an interactive visualization of this. And let's switch to the interactive visualization. And one of the nice things is that we can actually say, OK, in this population, I can actually drag this number around. And you can actually look at your profit as you're going through this. And you can see that over uh, in this corner right over here, you can see the profit sort of goes up uh, as I get the exact right point right around there. Now, if we give too few loans, we're not giving enough loans, we're not making enough money. If we give too many, people aren't, uh, sorry, here we're giving too few loans. If we give too many, then people don't repay them. Well, that's great. There's no real argument there. But what happens if you have two different populations? One population that might actually have a different behavior pattern based upon their credit scores than the others. So, for instance, if we just want to now maximize the profit, 
we end up with two different thresholds for those different populations. Now, suppose this population represents race or gender. You will actually be um, denying, you're only going to give 50% of this population a loan when you're giving 61% of that population a different loan. So there's all sorts of different strategies that you can look at. This is the way to maximize profit, and sometimes banks might only think about that. But you know, you might want to say, you know, we actually want to pile them all together and use the same exact threshold. Um, when you do so, you actually get quite a little less profit, but you might be fairer to the populations. But that's actually not even that fair because there might be a lot fewer of one population than the other. So there are other strategies like uh, we make sure that we give the same uh, uh, fraction of orange and blue, uh, make sure the fractions are the same, or we give the same fraction of the people that would actually pay off the loans. These might be fairer, but if you look at all these different strategies, it helps you say, oh, you know, bias is a complicated issue. And if you're, if you're looking at maximizing profit and you're looking at all sorts of other things, there are a lot of considerations. And being able to do an interactive example where you're dragging these things around and seeing those results really helps illuminate what's going on. Any single representation of this might have been a little bit harder to see. Okay, so let's go back to here. So now we'll get to a, a project that um, I've worked on for a number of years called Sandance. And Sandance is, a, is a, a, a tool for helping you look at multiple different representations of, of, of data. So let's, let's open up Sandance. And uh, it's available on GitHub and also, all sorts of other things you could actually extend to it. And we can just try it online. And when you're trying it online, you can either use data that's up there already. Um, we'll use uh, a couple data sets up there. Or you can use your own data. And that data never gets uploaded. It only is looked at locally. So you can try out data. It's completely private. It never gets uploaded anywhere. So l let me actually set this up uh, so that I'm not showing color. So none. And just look at your grid. So this, this first uh, data set is uh, some demographic data. It also has some voting data, but we're not going to go into any of the voting data, where every single one of these points has a bunch of different fields associated with it. There are actually about um, 25,000 records. And each of these records is kind of like a county. It's sub-county. It's called a, a census-designated place. But it's a small area with different populations. And you can see as I'm hovering over each of these things, you can see, you know, this is in the state of Georgia. It's Wheeler County. It's the Glenwood City in Wheeler County. You can see how many people and all these things. Now, when you look at it this way, uh, this is kind of like looking at a spreadsheet. You're just looking at a whole bunch of data. And it gets, um, you know, there's no patterns there. No, no, nothing comes out. And again, visualization is all, all about having patterns come out. Now, uh, one way that we can do it is we can look at this as a scatter plot. When we look at a scatter plot, you always saw that this, you can actually see the United States come out of this. Now, this isn't a map. This is just the longitude versus latitude. So there's projection issues and everything. But you can already see, okay, yeah, it's very recognizably the, in the United States. And I can switch to, say, a column plot. And this is essentially just a histogram by longitude. You can see actually all the points just kind of flowing up and down into these different areas. You can see, oh, I understand what a histogram is now, because it's really just counting up the number of points in each of those buckets. If I want to, I can kind of make the buckets. I can make more buckets and smaller buckets. And it starts, let's kind of bucket size there. And you can start seeing even patterns across the United States. So for instance, um, you know, out here in the East Coast, if I, I look at that and I switch to scatterplot, you can see that the East Coast sticks out a fair amount. Maine sticks out, and, and, and you can see that. You can also see that there's a lot fewer places here where there's the Rocky Mountains and the desert. So you're already seeing patterns emerge across this just by looking at different representations of this. And you can even see here that there's a lot fewer points that's very sparsely, uh, there are a lot fewer counties there. So one of the things I kind of wanted to look at was some uh, economic data uh, on this. So what we can do is it's, it's good to be able to color by the things as, as we looked at before, color really pops out to us. So I'm gonna color here by the income. And when we color by income, you can see essentially most of the country is living at pretty low levels. You can see that I don't see a lot of green here. Green represents high income. And in fact, you know, in this view, I hardly see any at all. So if we want to, we can go back to that column plot. And again, you can see maybe a little bit around here, which is the LA area and the uh, Seattle area and a couple of other things uh, in, in the Midwest. Again, let, let's go back to that uh, scatter plot. And I'm going to sort, make sure that uh, income 
shows up at the top. And yeah, again, you can see a little bit over here. And in fact, if we zoom in, you can see a little of those spots over there. So uh, again, not much high income. In fact, if we do a histogram by income here, let, let, let's actually, um, oops. let's do a column plot. And let's first sort by uh, the income. And you can see in each of these spots, there's this little sliver of high income in each of those places. Not much. Most of the places are at much lower income. And in fact, if we do a histogram by income over here, you'll see that most of the country is down here. This is the um, median income, and you're seeing that uh, a lot of the country is living at or, or near the poverty level. And you know that really shows this this skew, at least in counties. Um, one of the things I like to do is I like to kind of look at the relationships. Let's explore this a little bit more. So if we look at the uh, scatter plot of this, we can. One of the things I like to look at is the unemployment rates on this axis. So let's look at unemployment over here. So now you're looking at at this curve, which is to say, certainly the higher income counties have a lot less unemployment in general, a lot less variation too. So if we kind of look up here, what about these? These are very high unemployed counties that have very low income. And we can look, look at them. So this actually turns out that that's Apache County. It's an Indian reservation. Let's set that. This is Coconino County, another Indian reservation. And this is, uh, that's Apache County, a, a different uh, area. In and this is Navajo County. Every single one of these is um, a different Indian reservation. So it's like, wow, that uh, Indian reservations are, are really, you know, have, have low income and high unemployment. That's a problem over there. Well, one of the things I was kind of curious about was um, how, what about income, what about um, education? Does education help uh, deal with unemployment? So if we actually look at, um, education levels of each of these counties, you'll see that the curve looks very similar. It's very similar to income. Here we're seeing higher education over here, higher unemployment, and we're also seeing income. So now something to me popped out when I looked at this. I was noticing that off in this corner here, you're seeing some very, very educated places, but you see they're not they're not all green. There's some some there's this red one and this, this, this one that's that's not making much money. So I was curious, you know, where was this place that is very very educated? And by educate we mean the percentage of the people that have a bachelor's degree or higher, but they're not making much money. So when we look at this and hover over this, you can see it's Stanford, California, and it's where a lot of Graduate students are there. They already have their bachelor's degree. They're getting their graduate's degree. They're not. They're just living on a stipend. Now, that's a single outlier. Is this something like that weird correlation? You know, weird thing. Well, you know, the next place I looked at was was this place. So that's Forest Home. I didn't know where Forest Home or Tompkins County was. So if I, I click on it, we can actually get more info on this. We can just look this up directly in in Bing. So if I if I just look up Tompkins County here. It just goes directly to Bing, and you, you find out that um, it's the county seat of um, where Cornell is, Cornell University and uh, Ithaca College. So it's a yet another college town. So, okay, now I'm starting to see some trends. So let me actually switch this from education and employment to education and income. And then, now this is your typical trend. You're seeing upwards, more education, more income. But each of these points down here in this corner here, turns out that's Stanford, as we looked at before, that was Cornell. But every single one of these things, that's Cornell as well. Cornell, Cornell's spread out a lot of different counties. But then that's, that's Swarthmore. People might have heard of that. That's Emory. Uh, we go down here and we see uh, that's UMass Amherst. So every single one of these things down here is a college town. And to me, what was surprising is that college towns aren't in this data. They're, they're not represented directly in this data, but they are represented indirectly by having high education and low income. And again, I found that pattern because I saw an outlier and then I, I uh, came back. Uh, to it. Uh, one of the things about Sanus is uh, it, you can see already that I've used color, I've used different representations, but we, we can also use 3D to help, and sometimes 3D can help elucidate different patterns in the data. So for instance, if I switch to a uh, thir uh, 3D view here, we can actually look at here, I've got um, 
income, colored by income, and uh, on the z-axis I'm showing education. So you can see that the education levels are sort of uh, where there's the higher income, and you know we already looked at that before. But we can also look at sort of population density. So if I if I look at a stack view, you can see that. Um, this is where there's very dense areas on the east coast there and even on the west coast and things. And again, you're seeing in those high points, that's where you have high income levels. So each of these views can help you, and we can even rotate this to be able to see it from different angles. Uh, so it really can help you kind of get clearer notions of that data, and you can zoom in and, again, get any information on, on one of these places. So for instance, this is New York, New York, and you can see that it's very, very high income level there. Now, let me switch to a, a completely different data set. It doesn't have to be a data set of, of, of demographics. You can do, it doesn't even have to be a map-based demographic. Let's do one of the favorite da data sets that's often used uh, in machine learning, the Titanic data set, because it really helps us um, uh, understand the data that's used in machine learning all the time. And um, I kind of, let, 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 let's, let's kind of look at it. Right now what we're seeing is we're seeing um, all 2,207 people that were on the Titanic crew and passengers. And you can see how many survived the, the green ones and how many didn't survive. You can see that, that uh, only about a third of the people survived, and that's pretty daunting. But I, w I wanted to kind of look into this a little bit more and see if women and children um, survive the Titanic. So, so one of the things we can do very quickly is I can kind of say, let, let's look at just the people that survived, and I can isolate them. So now we've looked at just the people that survived, and then we can look at, at gender. So I, I'm going to switch to a column chart, and we can see that about the same number of men as women survived. And when I saw this, I was like, oh, oh, that, that, that's terrible. I, they, they didn't pay attention. You know, it's like only two more women than men survived. Um, what, what's, what's happening there? Well, again, it's not just a single representation. It's looking at, at this in context. So if we actually look at the total number, if we stop filtering and look at the total number of men and women that were on the Titanic, you can see that, that there were many more men. And by percentage, you know, by absolute numbers, the same number, but by percentage, men did pretty poorly. But that's not the full story. If we break this out by cabin class, so uh, we can facet this by cabin class, we can see that in first class, um, uh, women did really well, only five women died. In second class, they did pretty well, a few more died, but in third class, about half the women died. Now that, um, you know, is, is pretty daunting. It, it helped to be a first class female, but if you're a third class female, you didn't do that well, you still did much, much better than the men. But what about children? So let, let's actually um, look at the same sort of thing by uh, children. So if we, if we instead of cho choosing um, gender, let's choose age. Now, when we look at age, and we can actually say, let's bin this to be a little bit more, you can actually kind of zoom in here, and you can look at, in third class, one child uh, in, in, first, in uh, first class died, no children in second class died, and third class, about half the children died. And I was like, what's going on in this thing? So one of the things you can do here is you can click on this, and we can see who this person was. Uh, and if we actually look this person up, there's something called the Encyclopedia Titanica. We can look Miss Helen Lorraine Allison up, and it turns out that she was traveling with her mother, brother, and father, and the nurse took the brother off earlier. But the parents didn't know that, and they vowed not to leave until they were all together. So there's an example where they just say, again, really tragic. And it also goes on to say that she was the only child in first and second classes to die, but in third class, um, something like 60% of the, the uh, um, children died. So again, very striking. Uh, other representations give other meanings, and I kind of like this because it really helps humanize the data. So actually, let's, let's switch to a um, non-faceted view again, and let's look at something called a tree map. And here what I'm going to do is I'm going to size this by how much people paid for their tickets, and I'm going to color this by the cabin class that they're in. Okay. So here you're seeing that people in first class um, paid a lot of money for their tickets, they're very large, and uh, people in second class are orange, they paid less money, people in third class paid even less money and they're green. Makes sense. But there were a couple of outliers and aberrations that I found in this data. It's like, what's going on over here? Turns out that over here, there's this single person that didn't pay much money at all 
but they ended up in first class. So again, if we click through, I, I'm not going to actually click through the Encyclopedia of Titanica this time, but it turns out that this person, uh, a, um, a Mr. Franz Olaf Carlson, turns out that he was a captain on the line for uh, the, the company that, that did the Titanic, and there was a strike on a ship, so they gave him a first class ticket back um, on the Titanic, and he only had to pay taxes, which is why he shows up there at all. Um, Unfortunately, he's doubly unlucky. He didn't get to captain a ship, and he died. Um, there is one other person out here. Th this person over here, it's a, a Mr. Alfred Norney, and it turns out that he, you can see that he paid about as much as most of the um, second-class passengers, uh, and he didn't like his cabin, so he complained. So on the ship, he paid more money and it ended up in first class, which is why it's blue. And it turns out that because he upgraded, or maybe not because, but he ended up surviving the Titanic. So there it helps to complain and you end up surviving. But one of the things I, I like about this representation is that it actually helps humanize this data. You actually see that these are not just statistics. They're actually real people. And you can really t look at the stories and this links between the representation of the people and the story of the people. Okay, so um, there's one of the things that I've been doing right now is sort of telling you stories about the data. And this is kind of a trend um, about storytelling with data. Really, it's all about sort of giving context to the data and trying to understand the best way to present the data. And there are, there are books about these. I put these references in there so you can look some of these things up. And really, a lot of what I've discovered that works well has been discovered before. And um, there's this uh, nice uh, site, a map of... This is something called the Cognitive Bias Codex. I'm not going to go into the, all of this information uh, here, but you can see that there's some areas that I kind of unconsciously addressed uh, by doing the stories about the things, like having too much information or giving more meaning to the things. So it's, these are some of the helpful techniques that I found um, that, uh, that I used that you might not even realize. One of the things that I did is I really tried to help you understand the layout of that data. I showed you the, the X axis, the Y axis, what's the meaning of these things. And so in order to help you understand the data, I've given you a context and, uh, introduction to that data. And then I showed you an insight like the, the Navajo, uh, the, the Indian reservations so that you were kind of comfortable understanding. Yeah, I understand high unemployment, uh, low uh, income, yeah, I understand it, that makes sense. And then I showed you an aberration, an anomaly, that was Stanford. And um, it was like, oh, okay, I get it, that makes sense to me. But I wanted to see, does that anomaly generalize? Is that just a, 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 um, you know, a complete anomaly or is it really a trend? So I changed my view, I looked at all of the anomalies that were all together, and then I saw that that insight generalizes. And these were all things that I did step by step in this story to help you understand the data and the context of the data and how it works. And I think that's really important to, to help you understand things more completely. So um, the next area is machine learning. Now, Everybody is very interested in machine learning. It's even, uh, you know, people are hiring even more in that area. They're calling it the elephant in the room. And you say, okay, you know, do I need visualization at all? Do I need to understand my data if, if I'll just plug it into a machine and it'll give me the right answer? Yeah, it just learns from all these different examples. Why do I need to, to actually understand it? So what should visualization do in this context? Well, obviously I'm up here talking about this, so I think it has a role. Um, there, there's a, a, a real trend towards helping create interpretable models or interpreting ex existing models. Um, why? Well, People don't necessarily trust machine learning. You don't uh, uh, trust why these things work. Um, so you need to uh, help understand and explain them. You also need to understand what happens when they go wrong. You might need to assign blame for insurance purposes. It might actually discover what's really underlying Oh, You saw sort of these this uh, analysis that I did of the Titanic. Um, I'll show you a machine learning way of doing that. And that gives you a little bit of a deeper explanation of what's going on in a machine learning classification for who survived and who didn't survive. Um, also, if you're a machine learning builder, you need to improve your model. You need to figure out where. And finally, probably one of the most compelling reasons for companies these days is requirements under the data, general data protection regulation in Europe is that if you have any algorithmic decision, there needs to be some sort of explanation for that. So where does visualization come in? 
again, visualization is this bridge between the raw data, the models, the predictions, and the user. And again, that user could be the lay user or it could be the expert user. So um, something you might have heard is black box models and white box models. Black box models might be things like uh, neural nets that are really complicated, and white box models are models that might have you can open them up and explain them. And the, the techniques that I'm going to talk about here are uh, from a white box model that we looked at a couple years back. Um, there are also techniques for looking at black box models, but uh, in this case, I just want to focus on a, a little bit simpler to, to go about this. So in this case, we're going to be looking at some real estate data. Lots of people buy houses, and uh, so, so people understand uh, that you, know, you might buy a house, and, and yes, there might be location, but there also might be things like um, how many basement, how many bathrooms does it have? How many bedrooms does it have? Um, what's the quality? What's the year? And the, there's all these different features, and all these features combine together to give you what the value of that house is. Now, when you look at it like that, it really is pretty simple. If you if you build a certain type of model, uh, it's called a general additive model. You just add up all these features. So essentially, this is just adding up all these features for house number 550. House number 550 sold for, uh, we predict that it will sell for $190,000. Um, it's primarily, um, you know, the, the negatives about this is that uh, it's a pretty small lot. So um, we actually, from the overall average house for all the houses, yeah, it's, it, it, we took away a bunch. We took away $80,000 because it's a really small lot. And um, it doesn't really have a uh, second floor square footage. So we take away some more money. But it might have um, built fairly recently. And again, all of these things end up adding and subtracting together to, to, to produce the final result. It's great, simple visualization. People can understand that. You might have another house that sells for a similar amount. And it turns out that, you know, it has a curve that looks similar, a small lot area and a couple other things. But there, there's some differences, and we can actually highlight those differences. We can visualize those differences. So if we actually go down here, and you can see that, you know, some of the big differences, is a little hard to see, but uh, the biggest differences is, was the overall quality. The overall quality for this model was much better than the overall quality for this model. It was an 8 versus a 6. So this adds 22,000 and takes away uh, 14,000 from that one. Again, that's an explanation for why these two houses were sold for different amounts. You can also look at the uh, year it was built. That's another reason that, that, that offsets that. So you can see that these things all help understand the model. So we built an interactive tool. And this interactive tool not only lets us examine you know, these individual cases, but it looks at what's the trend of overall quality and how much does that impact um, the house, the price house. So let me show you that last uh, demo here. You can load in a bunch of different data sets. I'm going to load in the housing data set here, and you can see just what I was looking at before. Okay. So again, one of the nice things about this is that you, you can see that lot area makes a really big difference when we're a little bit there when we're when we're, we're small there uh, when it's a small order but it starts to make less and less of a difference likewise as long as you've got sufficient living area it seems fine and then it starts going up in value quite a bit more and again we can look as I hover over these things you can see that this particular house house number let's just do house number zero you can see um, is a relatively small lot area and therefore we take away a bunch of uh, money from the uh, predicted price but it's got uh, it was built fairly recently so we can look at uh, where the um, let's see recent areas you can look at all the different graphs uh, and we can look at the greater living area again it's a, a less living area um, first square footage is um, you know, also negative. And you can look at all the different qualities. And one of the nice things I find is that we can say, let's uh, compare house number uh, zero to house number six. We can get both these curves. And you can see exactly how they differ. And we can sort these in different areas. So you can see that the biggest difference between this and that, uh, the first house and second house, is that the second house had a second floor uh, square footage. But it was smaller on the first floor. It had a um, smaller basement and, and, and a bunch of other qualities. Now, I, I mentioned before that we can look at the Titanic data that we already looked at. This Again, it's a common data set that's looked at here. And we can say, OK, fair. 
how much they paid for their ticket, that makes a big difference as we go up and up and up and up. We saw that. Age, we didn't look at age, but you know, age makes a difference when you're really young. There's a better chance at, at surviving when you're young. Gender, well, uh, if the, one is a, a female, females had a much higher chance of surviving than men did, and you can see that right there. Cabin class has a much higher chance of surviving there. So again, if you pick on any particular person, you can say, oh, okay, this person was a um, uh, you know, third class uh, female, um, so you could, third class female, they paid very little for the ticket, and they ended up not surviving, and that's, that's what happened. So again, by looking at these models, you can get a better understanding of how it's making the decision, and that really is important. It's a role of visualization in that. Okay, so let, let, let's kind of wrap this up with some of the uh, take-home messages that, that, that I'd li like to have. One is, as, as you're probably aware, data science is, uh, is key to the future of, of employment. It's key to the future of, of a lot of things. And to me and to many others, visualization is a crucial component for people uh, to understand uh, data and to communicate that data. So... Um, Doing so means that you should take some time and educate yourself a little bit for appropriate skeptical inquiry. If someone shows you a representation, do you take it as reality or you really understand how did they slice that data? How did they represent that data? Um, I need to do that for both someone communicating with me and if, if I'm trying to figure out how to communicate that effectively. So um, one of my I, principles is that multiple representations and multiple statistics are important for you getting a better and deeper understanding of the data. Just one point might have some problems. You want to understand that context. Um, I feel that ML is wonderful, but you really it should be focused on augmenting human intelligence, not replacing it. So if that's the case, if ML is being used by uh, users, we need to help bridge that gap. And again, visualization is a key for bridging that gap. Um, all those tools that I showed you uh, are available for you to try on your own. So uh, you should go and try those. And um, if you can also click, uh, if you have more interest, you can uh, click through to the site. And I'll be uh, ready to answer questions uh, whenever you send them. Thanks very much. Hi, uh, thanks for watching this uh, webinar that was pre-recorded. Uh, this is Stephen Drucker. I'm here live to answer some questions that have come up. Uh, uh, thanks very much uh, for attending. Uh, I had lots and lots of questions, and I tried to get to some of them during the presentation, uh, but um, I wanted to address some in person here right now. Um, you know, lots of people ask for resources to learn more about visualization, and you can download the uh, resources that are included in this, this uh, talk to be able to read some of the books. There's also a number of different websites uh, that are out there. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, by Nathan Yao called Flowing Data, and he tends to collect uh, both uh, behind a paid wall a lot of existing resources and data sets to visualize, and also highlight some uh, current work that's going on. He's written a couple books that are very nice intro books on how do you visualize different types of information. And that was a, a trend that a lot of people were asking, uh, you know, how do they just visualize? Is their best way to visualize? Uh, one, one particularly interesting question was, why can't we just do this in an automated way? And in fact, there are lots of things and current work on chart recommendations for a certain set of data. Um, and you can do that in certain tools right now, including paid tools like Tableau and Power BI, and uh, even in, in Excel, uh, you can get chart recommendations for certain data. I think one of the points that I was trying to make in this uh, presentation was that uh, intention is an important part of visual communication. And when you know what you want to communicate, that's part of how you represent that data. And it's like in taking a picture. A lot of times you can do pretty well with automatic settings and just take a pretty good picture. But if you're really trying to highlight the foreground and uh, 
uh, blur the background, there are certain settings that you can use in the cameras to do that. It's the same way with a visualization. If you're trying to tell a story, you need to be thinking about what are the best ways for me to communicate this. Now, correspondingly, I've often gotten quest asked questions about, is there a right answer? What's the best way? I, I hope I address that in saying, look, you know, there are many ways of showing the data, and you really have to think about all the different fields and, and uh, representations. Uh, and try to be fair and unbiased. Uh, I, I referred to Alberto Cairo a couple times in his book, How Charts Lie. Um, he's got a current um, trend in ethics in data journalism and really talking about what are the principles of ethics behind doing uh, data journalism uh, properly. Um, there were lots and lots of low-level questions that people had. You know, whoa, how do I use this in Python? Uh, are these tools, how do they scale? Um, you know, right now, Sandance uh, is open source. Um, we can get to some of these uh, questions, and we, we've actually been uh, investigating putting them into a Python and notebooks so that you can be looking at your data in data frames, for those that, people that understand that, and then visualize that interactively right away. Um, we might be able to get to some of those things. Uh, the nice thing about being able to go into an open source world is that uh, people can attack these things themselves. And so we're, we're hoping that there'll be a vibrant community of people working on, on tools to, to do just this. Um, you know, I, I only touched a little bit on machine learning at the end. That's actually uh, a current trend in my own work is to look at, at ways that visualization can be used uh, both for interpretable models, uh, white box models, black box mo models. There was um, one question about are, are white box models more um, in, inherently interpretable? And there often is this trade-off between uh, understandability of the model and accuracy of the model. And, and we've been looking, and, and, and colleagues of mine who do machine learning research have been looking uh, for these models. And um, that gamut came out of, of working with one of those um, uh, models and trying to help give tools to see what people think is interpretable and what's not interpretable. So um, right now, it's great to have these additive models. They're fairly accurate, uh, and they're, they're fairly interpretable. But we're looking at other ways to look at um, black box models and interpreting those, both for um, end users, like I, I referenced the GDPR, but also for model builders and giving them tools. Um, I think that those were some of the big questions. Uh, there, I think, are a couple other things that, that we have time. I, I know that during the talk, the Morph Charts uh, link went down, but I believe that will be up, and, and you guys can try that. Um, again, we've made a lot of these tools available uh, to try both in isolation and within other tools. So, for instance, Sandance itself works in as a custom visual in Power BI. It also works in Azure Data Studio as an extension, and Visual Studio Code as an extension. And people can take it and, and make it as extensions for others. There was questions about incorporating that into R. Um, the, uh, a few uh, last remarks. Um, this is a big field, and I, I try to convey that data science, there's master's programs, and you can look around online for lots of resources uh, for learning about data science. Um, right now, those master's programs tend to be two years. I think two years is a small fraction of what it takes to really um, learn about this because people are learning everything from data engineering, where they're trying to figure out how to save data, to um, wrangling the data, so that they can get it in the form that can be represented, uh, to uh, understanding and doing the statistics, to doing the graphics and the design. There are so many different aspects of this. Um, this. This brings up one question that also came up quite often, which was, you know, how well do these data sets deal with raw data and how much do they need to pre-process the data? And then, again, that's a great question. Uh, you know, colleagues have been looking at better ways to wrangle that data. In fact, it's been estimated that uh, more time is spent on trying to get your data into shape to do machine learning or to do visualization than it actually takes to do the visualization. So building better tools for shaping your data and changing your data and filtering your data are, is very important. And most of these tools that I've shown here uh, take um, fairly clean tabular sets of data. Uh, that's, that's both Morph Charts and Sandance. Uh, 
The, the other tools, uh, like Gamut right now, um, you can use um, some online resources. Uh, I was using Interpret ML, and on the project page, you can see a reference to that. Uh, that's a package uh, put out by some of the machine learning researchers here at Microsoft Research that help build these uh, general additive models, or now they, they can also call them explainable boosted machines. So on, on the website, on the project, you can go to the live demo of this and try out some of those models that we built with this interpret ml or you can build your own and we'll be adding to that site to show how you can build your own and uh, hopefully that you'll be able to uh, soon just be able to take your own data and go through the entire process of having a model built fairly you know transparently for you and letting you view and understand the data an important part about machine learning is that it actually to me is just another part of understanding data. There's really nothing magical about it. It's just yet another tool to help you classify or do regressions on your data. Um, these, this is an ongoing area. I'm doing research and many of my colleagues, uh, both here at Microsoft and other places are doing research. Um, there was one set of questions that are dealing with 3D and holography and things like HoloLens and immersive data analytics. And again, this is an active area of research um, where people are putting themselves in VR rigs and looking at the data. Uh, it's kind of exciting in that everybody would feel like, oh, I have this other dimension of my data that I can visualize. How, how would these, um, uh, these this equipment help me visualize that data? Uh, to date, I think that there have been very few examples of effective immersive analytic visualization systems, uh, just partly because it's hard. Um, we, we have limited attention and limited ability to deal with multiple dimensions, and um, often we're used to having static visualizations explained to us, uh, and except in cases where there has been a strict uh, 3D coordinate system, like a map with overlaying data onto that, or in bio, uh, biological imaging, or you know, medical imaging, or in um, structural engineering, uh, there hasn't been that much utility found in looking at abstract data. There, there's a couple uh, recent papers that look at the effectiveness in looking at network data, because uh, network data can be very complicated to visualize and see, and maybe the addition of 3D can help. Uh, again, these are ongoing research areas. Uh, one thing I didn't call out is that there are a number of conferences that deal with this kind of thing. I come from a computer-human interaction background, and the main conference that deals with innovations in this area is SIGCHI, the Special Interest Group on Computer-Human Interaction. And that happens every year, and there's usually a visualization tract in that. There's also an IEEE conference called VIZ that deals with visual analytics, information visualization and scientific visualization. And a lot of these papers are all available. And while it might seem daunting to read some of these papers, uh, a lot of them are presented at a level that, that people can really um, uh, understand and, and, and read. So I'm hoping that people can find resources online. Uh, a lot of them are a, a search away. Um, you can look up data science and visualization tools. There were lots and lots of questions about what's the best open source tool and how do I use this in Python and Pandas, and, and there's, there's lots of discussions about that, and uh, I think you can just click away. So um, really just time for one last question, and um, I think the people are saying, you know, where is this going? And uh, this, again, is, is a great research area. I, I tried to leave this off on some of the bigger unsolved problems. I, I think that the current debate about machine learning um, is really interesting. It's interesting both from a technical standpoint and an ethical standpoint. Uh, my point of view is that um, machine learning can really help enhance our um, interaction with with the world. And I don't like to see computers replacing people as far as jobs or as far as um, solving problems without the person in the loop. I, I see it as an augmentation for human capabilities and finding the right ways and the right things to do. Certainly, it might replace uncertain tedious tasks. Um, 
it, you might get better and better about choosing the right visualization, but I think there needs to be a dialogue between the computer systems and the users that are uh, essentially mediated by uh, smarter and smarter systems, but it really comes down to how do we augment human capabilities. And that, that's, I think, where a lot of this work is going, both in helping build those tools and in how, how, you know, how do we use this technology in those tools. So um, thank you very much for, for tuning in. And um, that I would uh, looking forward to having further interactions with you.